Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real joy to be able to be here this morning to continue on the, the teaching of Jesus as he unpacks and leads us through what we know as the Lord's Prayer. I'm really thankful for work, being able to share the details of that um, with the knowledge and the expertise that he has. Many of the questions I'm sure that you have, it's better for him to give you the information. I learned my lesson two or three years ago when I tried to give a financial update one of the times instead of Lenny and a completely bottomed out, uh, and it caused more questions and more confusion off the back of that. So I'm so thankful, work for you being able to, to share that this morning. And yet, so listen, it's a real joy being able to just talk about the words of Jesus this morning. So we unpack this, the Lord's Prayer. And this morning, um, I'm going to be continuing just looking at where Phil began a couple of weeks ago around this idea and this aspect of adoration, of worship, as Jesus says these words in the Lord's Prayer, and he teaches us, hallowed be your name, Father. Uh, and and my, my, my encouragement to you is that if you didn't get listening to Phil a couple of weeks ago, or sorry, last Sunday, I would really love to encourage you. He began to teach on this aspect of adoration and worship, and it was just such a, a beautiful teach that just really blessed my soul. Listen, there's so much more that I feel that you could really try to teach into with regard to worship and different aspects of that. Many of you know that I've loved over the years has been able to be part of helping to lead worship here within church, and so there's lots that I would love to say, but simply, I would simply say this to you. Get listening to Phil's message that he shared last week. It just really blessed my soul. And so this morning, I'm not really going to try and add much more to what Phil was trying to say. There's a couple of things, obviously, in, in essence, that the Spirit, I feel, has, has given me this week that I would just love to, to share with us this morning. Yes, we will talk on adoration, but when it comes just to the heart and essence of adoration and worship, I would love for you to go back and listen to Phil's teach uh, as, as we do that. Remember, I want to remind us just at the beginning again, so a couple of weeks ago, this is what I was reflecting on as we lead into this and what we teach on the Lord's Prayer. I want us to just remind ourselves where this prayer came from, what it was coming in response to, what was the essence of why Jesus spoke these words. And remember the question that we reflected on in the first couple of weeks. You've looked at it in life groups over the last two weeks as well, but this is where it came from. Lord, Teach us to pray. This is what the disciples were asking. And, and what I was saying, I, I reckoned that this, this had come out, I'm sure from the disciples, had come out of a place of genuine hunger. They'd seen something in Jesus that they really saw was so different about the way that Jesus prayed that they wanted to learn from him. They wanted to learn from the rabbi in that way. But what I had said last week as well, uh, or two weeks ago when I spoke with this, I reckoned as well, though, that this came from a place, not just a pure hunger, but also came out of a place born from comparison and insecurity. Many people, it almost just seems to be that they struggle with prayer. I, I shared some of my own struggles with prayer. Phil has been sharing that as well. But when it comes to many of the struggles that we have with prayer, if we're going to name it, this seems to be the root issue that many of us struggle with when it comes out of this place of comparison and insecurity. It just leads us to this point where we almost feel like we're just not good enough. And the disciples are asking it almost out of this place. We see in, in Matthew 6 and in Luke 11, the two different references and places where, where this issue comes from. Firstly, they're comparing themselves to the religious people of the day, the people who almost had this appearance of righteousness. Uh, they're praying what seems to be the right way, the religious way, the way that you should speak to God. And, and this is the types of prayers that the disciples would have heard, words of long words, loud words, religious words. Say that again, long words, loud words, religious words. I'm sure you know many people that can pray like that. And listen, the last thing we want to do is to judge people that would pray in that way because many of them are praying out of a great heart in it and because they've learned to pray in that way. But what so easily happens for many people who are young in faith or for many people who have had a, a juncture in the road where actually in their walk with God and they're in an insecure place maybe in their relationship with God, when they compare themselves to people like that, it just feels like, I can't pray like that just feels like that their prayer just isn't good enough. The disciples, it wasn't just the religious people of the day they compared themselves to. They also were comparing themselves even to people at a peer level. And we see this in Luke chapter 11, where they asked this question, 
Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So there's these other disciples that are about at this time, John's disciples. And Jesus' disciples are looking at them and saying, they've been taught something new about prayer. And Jesus, would you teach us like them? And maybe for you, it's not even about where you compare yourself to spiritual leaders or to religious people. It's even when you compare yourself to your friends, to your family, it just maybe feels like that the words that you pray sometimes just doesn't match up to how they pray. And this is why, this is why when it comes to this, Jesus, when he presses into it, he begins to just tell his disciples, he said, listen, when you pray, pray like this. And so he says these words, Abba, our Father, this is where I left us. I really want to focus and center it around this again today, I feel, because even when we look at adoration and worship, there's no point talking about it without talking about the Father. And Jesus says this, when you pray, this is where it all begins, Abba, Father. Here's two lines that I shared the last time just by way of final reflection before we go on. But here's the two things that I feel is crucial for us to grasp, and you'll see them on your screen. Firstly, it's this. Prayer isn't so much what it's about, but who it's about. It's about Abba. It's about Father. And secondly, I want to say this. This is not religion. This is relationship. This is not about a religious way of doing things. This is about our relationship with Father God. And we're going to come back to this this morning. And so Jesus continues. Jesus goes on and he says, so when you pray, pray like this. And this is what he says. We know these words really well. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Two main things I just want to say on this. Um, we're going to take a shorter time. We're going to reflect on something at the end. We're going to worship together at the end as well with this. But the very first thing that Jesus presses into, and today I want to speak into this area of comparison again, because I think that this is one of the things that robs us in our relationship with God and in the beauty and then the nature and essence of what prayer is about. So as we speak and press into this issue of comparison, the first thing that Jesus says about that is this, and let's not miss the significance of this. He says, Abba, but he says this, specifically, Father in heaven. Father in heaven. You see, what can so easily happen is that we compare or we align our relationship with God who is in heaven with the relationships with other people that we have here on earth. It's almost like everything that we understand and a lot of the things which we can grasp about God, we filter it through our understanding of those things here in an earthly context. But Jesus is saying, this is Father who is in heaven. Many people and have a damaged understanding even of in their relationship with their earthly fathers. And even beyond those relationships, there's and, and some of the other relationships that we have with other people, there's a brokenness and there's a woundedness that comes from that. And so what many people have done out of that place of hurt and disappointment to protect themselves, they build walls, they build barriers to keep themselves protected and, and other people out and protect themselves from hurt and damage. And because of that, what happens, it means that these barriers in the relationship have meant that this has played into our relationship with God. How we relate to God and Father, has been broken and hurt by some of these other things. And Jesus, in a beautiful... And listen, this can almost seem like a really, really, really obvious statement. But I want to say this. For me, I feel that this is a heavenly distinction. This can either be a really obvious statement or it can be a heavenly distinction. And Jesus is making a heavenly distinction here. He's saying, this is Father in heaven. This father in heaven is significantly different to any earthly father or in comparison to any relationship difficulty we have ever had or experienced. This father is love. This father is pure. His desires for us are so good. He is the one who designed us. He is the one who created us. He is way above and better than anything we could ever compare to. And so Jesus, this is what it's almost like. Jesus almost in the essence of like a drop the mic sort of moment says, don't compare this father to anything you've ever experienced on earth. This is father in heaven. He's so passionate about you. His thoughts towards you are so good. His plans and purposes are that none would perish. The Bible says this really clearly. His plans and purposes are that none would perish. That's why we've just celebrated communion this morning because he was so moved in love towards that. He sent his own son in love for us. This is Abba. And while it's clear that not all have entered into relationship with him and not all will, 
This is still his heart. His heart is so much for us. He loves us. The Father is love. And so let, let me just say one thing, just in passing this before I move on to my next point. While our understanding of Father who is in heaven sometimes can be warped or misunderstood because of how we have experienced relationship here on earth and how we've been damaged in some of those, I want to say this with complete fullness and complete certainty this morning. As we engage with Father who is in heaven and we experience his love and his desire for us in this experience of love is to restore us and to heal us, what happens is that instead of our relationship with Father being warped by these relationships that which can be broken and which can be tainted, when we get to experience the love of Father in return, what can happen is that these relationships can be restored. These relationships that we have here on earth can be healed all because it flows out of knowing the love of Father in heaven. And so I want to prophesy to you this morning to many of the relationship, relationship difficulties that you're experiencing at the moment. I want to speak life and hope into some of the marriage difficulties that are represented in homes this morning. I want to speak life and hope into many of the relationship difficulties you're experiencing with your family this morning. I want to speak life and hope into many of the relationship difficulties you're experiencing, even with people in work, that person who does your head and that you think you just could never get on with. I want to say this, when you center yourself and position yourself in the love of Abba and you experience his love and the completeness of this, this is a game changer that changes everything. Yes, it's going to take a journey. I don't want to belittle or to play down anything about it, but it all starts with Abba, his love for us. This is Father in heaven. And so Jesus goes on to say, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus leads us really clearly. Only what he can say and only what he knows about the Father. He is holy. He's to be adored. He is to be worshipped. Imagine this. Listen, I said this the last time when I was here. You know what we can so easily do? The life groups reflected in this and some of the feedback we were getting from them as they're studying this as well. You know, sometimes what can so easily happen is that there's a desire for us that we want to teach our kids and, uh, and I reflected in some of our, my desires for that as well. And sometimes we can so easily put our stuff on our kids which means that they miss and lose it. But imagine this. Even Jesus, as a young boy at the age of 12, Jesus, while he was fully God, he was fully man at the age of 12. You all remember that narrative and that story where Mary and Joseph, they're coming home from Jerusalem to Nazareth. They all think that little Jesus is with each of them. They've misplaced him. And when they get back, they realize it's panic stations. Where is he? And when they get back to Jerusalem, they find him with the scribes and the Pharisees. They're amazed and wonder at the wisdom of this young boy. And Jesus is saying, why are you so panicked? Did you not know that it must be about Abba's business? <laughs> He's so engaged in a loving relationship with Father at the age even of 12. He is someone that is to be worshipped and adored. And so when we talk about adoration and worship, again, Phil did an amazing teach on it last week. This is simply where it begins and ends. This on the screen. Worship is about how we love and adore him. Worship is about how we love and adore him. And let me say this this morning really clearly. So last time I was here reflected on what does it mean to be the best prayers and we looked at the words of Jesus. They're not the ones with the biggest words and all of those sort of things. They're the ones that can go and close the door and just pray to God in private. <laughs> let me say this. The best worshipers are not those who can craft the catchiest melody of a song or, can, who, who, or who can declare the most poetic of words. The best worshipers are those who can worship and Worship him out of a place of total truth and out of a place of love. Let me say that again. The best worshipers are not those who can craft the catchiest melody of a song or who can declare the most poetic of words. The best worshipers are those who can worship him in total truth out of a place of love. This is why Jesus would even have said this in John's gospel. He said, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in this way where we just get to worship and adore him. I, I grew up 
as I've reflected many times, in a very traditional background. And growing up as a young boy, we learned what was known as the Westminster Catechism of Faith, the shorter Catechism of Faith. There was 150 statements of faith, pretty long uh, sentences, paragraphs. It was the hope that by the end of uh, Sunday school, which was P7, you would have learned all 150 of these. That Man, that was a big task, but when they offered you weekly prizes for doing it, it was a bit of an incentive. And uh, while there was many of them that I maybe forgot, I always remember the very first one of this. The question was simply this, what is man's chief end? What is the purpose of mankind? And the reply to it was simply this on the screen, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever in in the hurry and the the desire just to get this learnt in your head. I missed the point of what this was actually saying. You see, there's something about God for us to enjoy. John Piper, I don't often get quoting him that much, but John Piper takes this statement just a little bit further and says this, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. By enjoying him forever. And so I began by talking about, you know, because I've led worship for so many years, one of the things that I so easily said was, oh, I love worship. I love God. And what the years are starting to teach me is simply this. We can't say we love worship if we don't love and enjoy him, if we don't love and enjoy being with him, and we don't love and enjoy talking to him and with him. We can't say we love worship if we don't love and enjoy being with him or spending time with him or talking with him. Let me say this, if, if we don't enjoy being with him and getting to talk with him, then we need to redefine what it is we're actually saying that we love. It's not worship, it's just simply music. <laughs> worship is when we get to adore. This is what adoration is all about, when we get to adore him for who he is. And listen, this is what was so revolutionary about the words of Jesus that he speaks in this prayer. Because get this, the Israelites already knew that Yahweh was holy. They already knew that he was so above everything else. The prophets had told them this. They had declared it so many times over their existence and over their lifetime. They already knew this about them. For example, the prophet Isaiah would have spoke these words. They knew it so well. He said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. He talked about how the train of his robe filled the temple, about how he touched his lips with these burning coals. He knew that the Lord was holy. The apostle John, even in the book of Revelation, says he would reflect on how worship was happening and how the living creatures and the angels and the elders, they would cry out in a loud voice around the throne day and night. They never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This is not to take away from anything to do about the awesomeness and the holiness of God. But Jesus, in one of the most radical moments, Jesus sits in front of his disciples, his disciples who have known him so well as being a holy God. And Jesus sits and says to them, listen, it's not just about the fact that he is Yahweh and he is holy. You can call him Father. And I can imagine, just as we start to bring us in towards land, I can almost imagine the disciples starting to wince a little when Jesus said that. Do you ever have some of those moments, maybe it's just me, Do you ever have some of those moments where sometimes people would say something based out of their relationship with God and and there's a bit within you that almost winces where you think, is that heresy? Is that right? Is that right what they said? And I can almost imagine that that's what was going on with the disciples. They were like, Rabbi, this is Yahweh. You're saying we call him Father. Jesus wasn't trying to take away, and neither are my words this morning. But there's something about in the beauty as we engage with this holy and this awesome God. Listen, this is why we celebrated communion this morning. God has made a way for us to be able to come into a relationship with him. This is what King David, my hero outside of Jesus in the Bible, met. He had many faults. He had many wrongs. He was far from perfect. He did some really bad things. But this is what made the Father say he was a man after his own heart. David knew what it was to be in relationship with God, not engaging out of simply a place of religion. If you've been following along with our Bible reading plans, yesterday you would have picked this up in Psalm 34, these beautiful words of David in the Psalm. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 3, he says this. You'll see that on the screen. I will extol the Lord at all times. 
His praise will always be on my lips. I will glorify in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. And the king, this is David trying to call everyone with him. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And in the same psalm, in verse 8, David would then go on to talk about his experience. He would say this, taste and see that the Lord is good. We actually can experience his goodness. And so what Jesus is telling us, as we come to engage in prayer next week, we're going to take you in to just look at the different aspects and different ways and different depths the prayer can bring us into. But when we come to engage in prayer, let this be the first thing that we do. Firstly, we remind ourselves who we are. We are sons and daughters of Abba. And that as we come before him, the first thing we do before we bring our asks and our other parts of prayer is that simply we take time to be with him and to enjoy him. I last week shared a story about these two. Um, this, these are my kids, Rose and Josiah. Last week I reflected on a story about Josiah. I said this to you about, I'm, I'm recognizing during this, this last year particularly, there's lots of the things that I'm learning about God. I'm learning it through them. And it was another one of those moments for me during the week. Sorry, I'm not going to keep bringing pictures of my kids every time, but it was just one, another one of those moments. And I felt I just really wanted to share it this morning. I, I don't know about you, but our, our pattern in our life, we've all been affected in different ways. Listen, there are many people who work hasn't been able to happen, people who've been in furlough and different things like that, and our prayers for you. And we've all been affected in lots of different ways with homeschooling. And, and Laura and I have found that even with our work levels and things, the amount we've had to do is almost it feels has gone up. <laughs> it's been the difficulty of things. And so even just the balance of stuff at home sometimes has been difficult. And, uh, and yet this week, on Thursday, we just had a moment where both of us were available at night time. We weren't in at different things and at different meetings. And and so we both took one of the kids each and we put them to bed. And so I put Rose to bed that night. And as we were going to bed, I said to Rose, listen, we'll read a story and we'll pray together. And Rose was almost like trying to maximize this. She said she was going to look for a book. She took ages to look for this book. And I was starting to get frustrated. What on earth is taking so long? And eventually she came in, she brought it, her E100. It's a version of the Bible, 100 of the most significant passages in the Bible. She brought this in because she knows probably, firstly, it was really long stories, so this is going to be a bit longer before she goes to sleep. She knows that I love it, so I'm not going to say no as well. We read this together. We prayed. She put her wee, uh, her wee head on my chest, and she lay there, and we just started just to, just to chat, and she started just to go to sleep. And in my head, I'm starting to think, I have so much to do tonight. I have so much to do, and I'm starting to think, right, I need to send that email. I need to do this. And I lay with Rose for a couple of minutes and, and I started to get up. And as, as I started to get up, she gripped me so tightly. She gripped me so tightly. And she just said these words. She says, Daddy, don't go. She says, Daddy, it's been, it's been ages since we've done this. She said, Daddy, it's been ages since we've done this. I was almost like one of those moments for me, just even in my engagement with Father God, just recognize sometimes we can just go through the motions. And it can be ages from when we get to actually get to do this, just to be, and just to enjoy, and just to love Him. And maybe it's been ages, and you know what? It's the heart of the Father. He just wants it so much. His desire is for us. You know, one of the most significant things we need to do, because this is relationship, we need to keep love alive. Every relationship needs this. It needs a level of investment. We need to keep love alive. If we don't, familiarity sets in, apathy sets in. We just become so familiar. We become bored. We just grow distant. We grow cold. You might have experienced that in different things, and this is so crucial for us. I love this quote that I read in a book during the week by Louis Angley, and he says this, in the Western world, Satan's tinkering has yielded a material, humanist, enlightened, postmodern society built upon the faithless, cynical assumption that the most superficial distractions of life are actually the sum total of our purpose. Thus, our days are spent overstimulated to the point of numbness, irony of ironies, a gluttonous, indulgent, entertainment addicted, twitterized, aged, filled with illicit desire has produced the most bored and boring people. It's a bit of a bold statement, but it caught me. And it's true. You see, we can give our love to other things. 
We can give the love of our heart to other things and to keep love alive. We need to daily position ourselves in this love to make time to focus on this desire. For me, this is what I find, if I was being honest, in the significance of fasting. I know we did this at the start of the year, but throughout this year, it's one of the, the, the disciplines that I've just started to really try to build in more of an ongoing rhythm. Um, I know we all fast in different ways, but by being able to set things aside to focus more time on them, I've been able to center myself more in the presence of Abba. And I, f- I feel like I'm hearing him better. I feel like I'm enjoying him more just by being able to get time. It's been so long since we've done this. I'm having some of those moments. This is my encouragement to you would be, how do we just choose, make wise choices to keep love alive with Father? My encouragement to you this week, we're going to just finish with one simple thing, one exercise. We're going to just, because this is about adoration and worship, we're going to listen to a song that's going to be on the screens. And then I'm going to pray for us as we close. This week, as you come to pray, my encouragement to you is just enjoy him. Just enjoy him. Just enjoy him. One of the simplest prayers, I think it was by Brennan Manning, he wrote a prayer called Abba Prayer. And it goes something like this. You see it on your screens. And this is what I'd love you to do this week. As in the simplicity even of breathing in, and breathing out. As you breathe in, we're just simply saying the words Abba. And as you breathe out, we're saying, I belong to you. So as you breathe in, you're saying Abba. As you breathe out, you're saying, I belong to you. And so for just just a few, 30 seconds, I would just love us just to do this this morning. And then off the back of it, the guys are going to just play the song. We'd love you to meditate on the words of it and just enjoy worshiping Abba this morning with me. And then I'm going to pray for us as we close. But why don't you just position yourself this morning? Why don't you close your eyes and even just hold out your hands? And I would love you to just breathe in and to breathe out. Just allow yourself to be still in his presence this morning. A deep breath in. And breathe out. And as you breathe in, I would love you to pray with me. So pray, Abba. As we breathe out, say, I belong to you. Let's just do this for a few times. Abba. I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Let's worship him with the words of this song this morning. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.